I am going to get this next one started, uh, both because I'm really excited to hear what our panelists have to say, and also because I know that uh, one of our panelists, Jane Kaminsky, has a flight to catch, and I'm not going to make her uh, late to her gate. Um, uh, I'm, you know, this is uh, largely an MIT-focused conference, but we also uh, are being kind of ecumenical in the approach we're taking and being uh, you know, very conscious about wanting to hear the perspectives and experiences of other groups. And so uh, when the organization you're going to hear from next, the Council on Academic Freedom at Harvard, was formed earlier this year, I obviously watched it with, with great interest, and I knew that uh, we would be lucky to have a couple of their representatives with us for a panel at this conference. So uh, I'm pleased to firsthand and uh, hand this to Brian Paul from the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, who will uh, introduce the panelists, I think. Um, uh, but either way, uh, please uh, welcome our next panel. Thank you, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you this morning. Again, I am Brian Paul with the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. I specifically assist with our alumni advocacy efforts. So this really is an exciting thing for me to be at today. I recognize so many faces here, colleagues in this line of work, and I see plenty of new faces. I really look forward to meeting as many of you as possible here today. I wish to open up here just to lay the groundwork for our panel with just a couple of quotes that I think will set the stage nicely before our panelists take a moment to introduce themselves. Uh, the first comes from ACTA's own president, Dr. Michael Polyakov, who has been engaged in affairs related to campus reform for many years. In our upcoming publication of keynote remarks for our annual Alumni Summit on Free Expression, which is co-hosted by ACTA and the Alumni Free Speech Alliance, of which MFSA is a part, Dr. Polyakov opens with these words. Alumni are the guardians of values whose wise counsel and deep experience are essential for the course correction that America's colleges and universities so desperately need. AFSA, of which MFSA is a part, is an idea for which thousands of alumni throughout the nation have yearned. And of course, we are honored to work with AFSA and MFSA in this work. And when ACTA was founded in 1995, we actually had a different name, the National Alumni Forum. So strongly did ACTA's leadership believe in the importance of alumni involvement in preserving these core values of free expression, academic freedom, and viewpoint diversity. That is the basis on which ACTA was founded. That is the basis on which AFSA and so many alumni have organized and come together on this front. And it is around this cause, this common desire for campus freedom, for the ability for students, faculty, others at this special place, as we discussed in the last panel, can come with open inquiry to discover new ideas and seek for better, higher truth on many issues. Faculty play a critical part in this as well. In fact, they are the pillars. If alumni are the guardians of values, then faculty really are the pillars that allow the university to truly uphold those core values. I am a huge fan of entertainment media, of different film depictions, especially in the realm of education. One quote from such a film, Universal Pictures, The Emperor's Club, has this masterful tribute to teachers. Quote, a great teacher has little external history to record. His or her life goes over into other lives. These men and women are pillars in the intimate structure of our schools. They are more essential than its stones or beams, and they will continue to be a kindling force and a revealing power in our lives. That moves me so greatly because it shows how essential teachers, instructors, professors are to the success of higher education, and education in general. There is so much controversy and talk right now related to academic freedom, the role of faculty at the university, the, even the question as to whether a college degree is even worth what it is or should be still pursued and considered a part of our national framework. And what's fascinating to see, in addition to alumni rising, is to see faculty 
rising as well to the occasion, and especially faculty associated with the Council for Academic Freedom at Harvard, which is what we're gonna now take the time next hour to learn more about. So with that, I wish to turn it over to Dr. Flynn, as I remember last names here, Flynn Craddy and Dr. Jane Kamensky, who will talk with us more. Each of them will take a time in turn, starting with Flynn and then Jane to introduce themselves and their work with CAF, the Council for Academic Freedom at Harvard. And then we'll jump into some moderated Q&A, followed by audience Q&A. Flynn. Great, uh, thank you so much for, oh, you can, you can all clap, that's <laughs> Uh, thank you all for having me, and it's wonderful. I've, I've been admiring the work that the MIT Free Speech Alliance has been doing from afar, or not too far, from a couple miles down the road uh, for quite some time, so I'm, I'm very happy to talk to you. I'm also very delighted that there's a, a Harvard recent alum and a har current Harvard student. Um, you can talk to them after, here in the front row. They will tell you what's actually happening at Harvard. Um, we go home at night. Um, but they actually stay there all the time and so have a, have a, have a great perspective. Uh, my name is Flynn Craddy and I am the executive director of the fairly new Council on Academic Freedom at Harvard. Um, I have a couple of jobs at Harvard. I also teach in the history department, British history. Um, but I've been involved with the council from its very kind of outset. Um, we started organizing ourselves sort of accidentally uh, back in October. And um, I invited a group of Harvard faculty members to dinner just to talk about free expression. And we had a kind of enthusiastic turnout of about 15 or 20 uh, faculty members. And we decided at that dinner that we should start some sort of council to organize together. Uh, today we have, I think as of yesterday, 137 members, um, representatives from every school at Harvard. Uh, we, we, we didn't have anyone from the... De uh, I'd rather not answer that question. Um, it's uh, too small. It, it sort of depends on how you count, because technically all of the doctors at the Harvard hospitals are faculty, so that's like 12,000 faculty members. Um, so in terms of, in absolute terms, it, that, it's a fairly small percentage, especially if you count all of the, the med school folks. But there are about 2,000 faculty, I think, in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Um, so it's, uh, it's, uh, we, but we've been growing, and we've had a really, really great, um, great response so far. Uh, we have members from every school. Um, we, we didn't have anyone from the dental school, so we put out the call for an oral surgeon, and, and we got one uh, who <laughs> believes passionately in free expression on campus, which is wonderful. Um, and we are kind of just now, uh, this, this fall, uh, organizing um, and, and kind of getting to work. In fact, we have our kind of our own meeting this, this, this evening. So i um, delighted to be here, and I'm also delighted to talk about ways that faculty and alumni and other constituencies on campus can work together to promote free expression and intellectual diversity and all the values that we care about. Thanks, Flynn. And, and at some point, I want to know why I was one of those 10 or 15 faculty that got invited to the October dinner. Like how you, how you identified people who might be just the um, best. We asked who are the best. Interested in this, <laughs> um, interested in this work. So I'm, I'm Jane Kamensky. I'm a tenured faculty member in the Harvard History Department. Um, I teach American history, especially the history of the founding era of the United States. I'm also the director of the Schlesinger Library on the history of American women. Um, and as a, uh, as a archive that documents family, gender, sexuality, we deal with a lot of hard topics. And I have been interested in how the library work of collecting on all sides of issues and sort of tacking the boat into areas of rough seas um, can translate better to the Harvard campus. Um, as I said, I'm tenured here. I've been here for nine years. And um, I answered Flynn's call in part because of an awareness that I was just totally chicken shit, honestly. Um, uh, I had been invited to be a founding member of the Academic Freedom Alliance and had declined. Um, not because I didn't think that their work was right, but maybe I didn't want to be called out as a founding member. Um, I have since joined uh, with a, you know, in a, in a cowardly um, and somewhat, in a cowardly and somewhat belated way. I have pulled things off my own syllabus, um, not because I didn't believe in their intellectual value, but because I had become convinced that I lacked the positionality successfully to teach them to our student body in the, um, the post-2017, 2020 
era. Um, uh, so I was thrilled that a group of faculty who might have each other's backs uh, were organizing to begin discussions. The number of people who have said, you're so brave for doing that, is frankly alarming. Right, it's, it's, the, it's pretty much the least brave thing that a tenured faculty member could do is to investigate the purpose of academic freedom with our, um, uh, our campus colleagues um, and especially our students. Um, and I would say, uh, so there are six co-presidents on, uh, on the Council for Academic Freedom at Harvard. Um, it's not a terribly workable governing structure. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it, it, it does mean that, that um, uh, the spotlight is spread and, and we represent a, a cross section of the schools, the 13 schools that, um, that Flynn talked about. And I would say that one of the things that I found thrilling about this group, which has been meeting uh, for the better part of a year now, um, is that we disagree so often. We disagree about what brought us to the work. We disagree about how we should proceed in the work. Um, it's sometimes, uh, you know, an existential level of disagreement about priorities, about tactics, um, sharing strategy. It's always respectful, and we always grow through those discussions, which is, of course, exactly what we want for our students. Um, so the role that I play among these six presidents, which is not quite the role that I play in real life, is as the resident optimist, um, <laughs> where um, uh, you know, I think as an instructor in an elite university, um, there is advantage to be gained in treating the deficits we see as deficits of our own uh, skill and portfolio as instructors, right? Um, we're teachers. How can we teach the skills of dialogue across difference, the value of different opinions? Um, nobody is born knowing those things. Very few family cultures nourish them through childhood and almost no K-12 schools in the United States uh, that aren't classical schools, say, um, take that work and place it front and center. So our students get to us with a skills deficit that is like the skills deficit of they don't know Mandarin or um, uh, they don't know linear algebra. And um, one of the things that I've been um, motivated by in this work is thinking about how do we do that skills building with each other as a faculty um, and then in the classroom. Wonderful. Thank you both for sharing your uh, origin story with CAF. And I'm going to shorthand Council for Academic Freedom as CAF just as we move forward here. Um, tell us a little more about your experience on the ground as faculty members. From your view there in the trenches, on the ground in education, higher education, what is the state of academic freedom and free speech in the classroom and outside the classroom? <laughs> Yeah, that's a wonderful question, and, and, and Jane will be able to speak more knowledgeably with a more teaching experience than me, but I, I started actually thinking seriously about these issues. I can actually remember the conversation with a group of undergraduates, and I, um, I, I did a little reading group um, on, on speech and disagreement, and I asked, I asked them, do you find it difficult to talk about like controversial questions on campus, and the answer was pretty much universally yes, that these are, it's difficult, there's a lot of fear about them, and, and a couple of the students um, had been on the editorial board of the Harvard Crimson. Uh, and the editorial board is quite massive, I think anyone who wants to can more or less join it, and so I said, and they, said, they started talking about what that was like, and what they said was that the very first person to speak in any discussion on the editorial board set down a, mark, a marker. Um, and nothing could be said to the right of that in the rest of the discussion. Um, and it didn't matter how far left that initial comment was. Um, it just, that's the marker. And so you could, you could attack from the left, but never from the right. And so the students I was talking about, uh, talking to had just kind of given up. They stopped going. They said, what's the point? If on the editorial board of the, of the campus newspaper we can't disagree, well, why should we even show up? Um, and I think that that is a sentiment that is like transferable to a lot of domains, certainly in the classroom, but I think even more in campus life more generally. I think a lot of faculty feel the same way talking to their colleagues 
um, that there are, are uh, difficult um, difficulties and, and dangers in, in speaking your mind in different ways. Um, but at the same time, I realize that there are a lot of students and I think a lot of faculty who actually are worried about this and don't want this to be the kind of uh, institution that they teach at or study at. Um, so there was a kind of coordination problem. That there's, you know, in every department at Harvard, in every dorm or college, you know, residential college at Harvard, there are people who are thinking, boy, it would be great if someone did something. Um, and so we thought, well, why don't we just get them together and the, take, the, take the one in, in, in the Kennedy School and let, introduce them to the one in evolutionary biology and, and like we can actually gather them together. And so that was the sort of process that kind of, I think, brought me to this, thinking, thinking that there is a, there's, there's, there's both, a, and like Jane, I, I tend to be somewhat optimistic about this, there's, there's, a, there's a challenge that we're all very familiar with, but there's also opportunity and that there are a lot of people who want to do something and we just, just kind of need to bring them together. So you may not be able to see this, but I'm older than my friend Flynn. Um, uh, this is my 30th year on a university faculty this fall. I took my degree in 1993 and, uh, and started off at Brandeis, where I served for 21 years, or 20 odd years, some odder than others. Um, and so I've, I've seen a pretty big arc of speech issues on campus. Um, and I wrote my first book about the history of speech in Puritan New England. And uh, so took my degree in, in 93, published that book in 97. And when I was completing that work, so uh, to just, a, just two minutes about the 17th century. So in the 17th century, um, in Puritan New England, people of the book, right, um, uh, there was a belief that words had almost physical power in the world. Uh, there were 120 odd uh, speech crimes that you could be punished for in Puritan New England, several of which carried the penalty of death. Um, and it was this profound faith, literally faith, um, that words starting with God's words acted as slings and arrows in the world, and so you had to be very careful about where you use them and how you use them. And as I published that book, there was a new body of work just beginning to come out, um, to come out of uh, a certain strand of radical feminism centered on the anti-pornography movement um, and out of the beginnings of the anti-hate speech movement um, uh, wing of civil rights. So there's this convergence between feminist and civil rights thinking um, about the way speech acts in the world. And I have a couple of flippant sentences at the end of that 1997 book, like, is this neo-Puritanism? Huh, who knows? Um, uh, so now that 1997, uh, 1990, you know, 1989-1997-ish work, about speech as harm has become the water in which we swim. So over the course of my teaching career, I have seen an economy of speech um, just completely shift its bases. And I think a, a very hard thing about having the kinds of conversations that Flynn described is there is a pervasive belief that words are sources of harm. I don't know how many of our children in any part of the United States grow up hearing what people my age grew up hearing almost every day of their lives, which is sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I think there is now a, a pretty widespread conviction, and we could sketch its left version, and we could sketch its right version, that words are very dangerous, right? What are the, what are the book banning bills um, that are coming out of the MAGA right right now, if not um, a kind of tacit acceptance of Kimberly Crenshaw and and uh, Catherine McKinnon's understanding of the way that words act in the world. This is ironic, um, but the, the orthodoxy about harm is widely shared. I think our students share it almost universally. Um, I think our faculty are more steeped in it than they know because like the water in which we swim or like the frog in the pot, the false analogy, it's gotten warmer and warmer and warmer and, um, uh, and uh, harm trumps. Harm trumps. Somebody says, I feel harmed by that, and the reading comes off the, uh, the syllabus. Um, so I think, I think I know few campus conversations where we're not steering through the thickets of um, uh, what do we do given that speech harms. 
it's become, uh, it's become a kind of a priori, speech harms. Therefore, how are we going to navigate? Um, have, how are we going to navigate these difficulties? As we start talking about different constituencies on the university landscape, I think it's very important to talk about the growth of the student life apparatus across that same 30 years. Um, I went to college in 1981, graduated in 1985. I had never heard of something called student life. Um, I could have used it, actually. I came from a, a lower middle class background. It was very hard to navigate an Ivy League college. There was nobody to steer me. Um, student life uh, and student wellness have exploded over the last generation, and that um, that sort of first derivative growth, I think, has become even steeper since the pandemic, as we worry um, genuinely and with good reason about the wellness and safety of students whose landscapes of social trust have been badly fractured um, by the years that they spent at home. So. Um, faculty aren't the only ones messaging about what robust conversation looks like. And I think the, the fear of harm, the concern for harms that come from hearing something that you might not like um, is, uh, is strongly reinforced by many, um, uh, many corners of the student life operation. I see my students for three hours a week. Maybe they come to office hours, so maybe, maybe five. Um, uh, maybe we have dinner. Student life sees them 20, 30, 40 more hours a week. Um, so um, the inputs of different kinds of authority structures on the campus, I'm not convinced that faculty are the pillars anymore, actually, which is its own, um, which is its own whole thing. So um, I think there is a hunger among students. Like, um, People don't like being told that they're very fragile and that anything that comes at them from any direction might harm them. Um, but I think that is the point from which we start, is this sense of precarity, personal precarity around ideas. And I'm, I'm talking too long, as I often do, but I'll say one more thing. Um, after the Dobbs decision came out, Schlesinger Library had been working on an exhibition and conference uh, on the 50-year life of Roe v. Wade um, for three years uh, since uh, 2020 um, pointed toward the 50th anniversary of the decision in 2023. Um, and it took on a kind of new urgency and the contours slightly changed after the Dobbs decision. And in the course of publicizing this work, um, doing development around this work, I was talking to a student who said that she had heard after Dobbs on the Harvard campus both protests against the decision and counter protests by people who thought Dobbs righted a terrible moral wrong. And I said, you know, so how, how was that? And she said, well, it was just terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. I did not feel safe. I do not feel safe on our campus knowing that um, uh, people disagree with me on something so important. Um, and I said, you know, I'm thinking of teaching a course on abortion where I would work with the various student groups, uh, you know, conservative and religious, as well as uh, gender supportive and, uh, and women's rights aligned groups to bring people um, uh, from this, you know, representing the spectrum of opinion on the campus, which I estimated to be about 80-20. So um, uh, more on the repro rights side than the national dialogue, which is about 65-35, um, uh, but, you know, non-zero. And she said, one in four people on this campus disagree with me? Which, um, so, uh, yeah. quantitative reasoning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, um, and she started to cry, wow. right? And, and I take this as genuine and also as conditioned mm. response, right? Like what does it, you know, this is a 20-year-old that got into Harvard and is flourishing there. Um, this is a genuine response of, of pain and threat mm. from, uh, from just knowing yeah. that there is difference. Um, so, I, I, just to underline, I think we're starting from this position of speech as harm and, and thinking about how to teach into it. And if I can just jump on the end of that too. You know, most, many of you, I think, probably have had young children. And we've, so you've probably had the experience where a two-year-old is running on the sidewalk and she falls down. And the first thing she does is look at you to know, 
am I okay? And you know, with, in my house, like there's a very stark divide between my, how my wife and I handle this moment. My wife runs over and picks, picks the child up and kisses her and says, you're fine. That's student life. Yeah, that's student life. <laughs> and, and Don't I, sue. Yeah. Don't sue, that's the... And I say, you're fine, get up. And um, you know, neither are always wrong, right? Um, but um, I think that, and I'm not comparing students to toddlers here, I'm comparing like, humans to toddlers. Because I think all of us at various points look and say, am I okay? Is this okay? And our, our universities have for a long time been saying, you're not okay. Um, and they learn that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they have these things reinforced. Um, and so Jane is, is wonderful in our council. She's the one more than anyone else who talks about skill building and training. Um, I think that's essential. I think there's also, a, a, there's, there's maybe another component which we might think of as virtues, as like intellectual mm -hmm. virtues, like courage being one of them, um, and resiliency, that these are things that, need, that we need to learn and we need to help our students learn, um, that it's sometimes you can dust yourself off and your, your knee might be a little skinned, but like, it's okay, it'll heal, uh, and you might be a little bit, bit, bit better for it, so, oh, yeah. I don't know, Flynn, uh, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff come pretty close to more or less defining the current student as infantile and uh, <laughs> toddlers in their own way, but point taken that um, in this context, what differentiates CAF from other campus initiatives to support free speech, academic freedom, and viewpoint diversity? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think in some ways they're really similar to like some of the alumni groups. We, we are, are, are at various points working with the Harvard Alumni for Free Speech group, um, which is also kind of getting off the ground. Um, we're all, I think, trying to do it broadly the same thing is like bring a lot of people who are scattered around and don't know each other together to work on a common cause that's important. I mean, the most obvious thing is that we're just a faculty group. Um, and we're tr we, we want to work with administrators, we want to help facilitate students who might want to have parallel groups, but we have decided that we are going to be just a group for faculty. Um, because we have this unique role as faculty on campus, not just in setting the curriculum, but actually in being the sort of institutional memory. Um, you know, the, the undergraduate population turns over every four years, but we have many faculty who have been teaching at Harvard for, for, for decades and decades. Um, and so that is, I think that's, that's the thing that we're looking, looking towards, um, is, is trying to have a kind of long-term presence within the university um, that can both, um, you know, in moments of crisis, stand up and be a, hopefully a bold voice for the values that we've been talking about, um, but also at the same time sort of quiet behind the casino's presence to, to kind of turn, this, turn the ship just a little bit. Uh, toward, uh, toward like a healthier uh, intellectual climate, a place where people can talk and disagree without you know, bursting into tears all the time. I think of us, and, and this sounds absurd from a tenured member of the Harvard faculty, but I think of us as being quite bottom up. Um, so it's faculty who self-organized. Uh, we have <laughs> somehow through Flynn's wizardry, um, we, we have an account number, a chart string to which people can donate money. So we're enough of Harvard that we function as an entity, but no one authorized us. We authorized ourselves. So bottom up in the sense of self-authorizing. Um, and, and lateral faculty peers, and we should talk about who's missing from this 130 yeah. because there are some profound absences. Um, we can think of other models that are top down um, and successful because of it, and the one that comes to mind for me there is Middlebury after their disastrous violent incident where a political science professor was assaulted and I believe hospitalized um, during a speech by Charles Murray. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the president and trustees took this on. They got a $25 million grant from uh, Carnegie Foundation to do um, what I think they're calling uh, transformational conversations. Um, and it's become a campus-wide initiative. So if you're a faculty member at Middlebury College, if you're a student, you are buying into this agenda because it's the president and the trustees' agenda. Um, I dream of that. Um, $25 and then, million. Dollars. Yeah, the $25 million would be nice, too. Um, well, I, I also Holy. think, um, you know, I don't want to make administrators the holy grail, but when you have signaling from the top that something is important, everybody gets the message that it's important. Um, and we could talk about what our signaling is, but it ain't that. Um, and then there are other sort of middle out um, 
efforts, and MIT seems like that to, my, to me, where uh, you have a whole, a whole campus statement about free expression, um, which was adopted by a large plurality of faculty and, uh, and endorsed. So that's at an institutional level, and you have um, the involvement of these large numbers of alumni um, as key stakeholders. Uh, Duke has another kind of middle out uh, effort where um, there's a group of faculty sort of building in the middle, working with student life. They've got a free speech dorm. They've got a free speech affinity dorm. Um, uh, you know, showing an administration that there is enough instructional skill and alumni support that, um, that the administration perforce becomes interested in the work, um, not only because it is right and true, but because there is money on the table. Um, so um, that seems yeah. like a, a, a sort of third successful model. I hope that, um, that we will reach the middle, um, and I, I think we have enough momentum that perhaps we can. And so describe these 137 members of CAF. How are you all similar? How are you all different? And how do you navigate the differences as you fight for greater expression on campus? It's a great question. And Jane already hinted at this. Um, so there are some um, really, gr I mean, there are lots of great things about our members. I'm grateful for all 137 of them. Um, but if you, if you were to go through our membership list, you might notice some, some kind of interesting omissions. Uh, one of which, probably the most pro uh, kind of obvious one, is that almost all of our members are full tenured full faculty members, full professors. We have almost no junior faculty at all. So of our 137, I haven't done a recent count, I'm thinking maybe close to 130 are full professors, not even tenured associate, but full professors. Um, many of whom have been at Harvard for many, many years, many of whom are har some of Harvard's most distinguished faculty members. Um, and we can we sort of try to speculate about the reasons why junior faculty members don't join. I think probably one of them is that it's just a very, um, you know, being an untenured faculty member, at a, even, even at a place like Harvard, feels very precarious, and many of them don't want to rock the boat. Um, but I think there's also probably genuine kind of generational differences about how people think about these issues. I think our younger faculty, many of them, really don't know that they want a kind of culture on campus of full and robust dialogue across difference. Um, and then I also think, and, and this is the more optimistic part, I think that there are a lot of faculty members who are in the last third of their careers, maybe in the last you know, fifth of their careers, who are now looking back and kind of wanting to think about legacies. Like what kinds of in, kind of an institution am I leaving behind when I when I kind of retire, um, and they want it to be a healthier place uh, than than it is now. Um, so that's one of the one of the kind of obvious features of our membership, and I'm sure. Yeah, and the and the other one is disciplinary. So we have far more people um, in the biomedical sciences, in the hard sciences, in the quantitative social sciences than we do in the qualitative social sciences, and especially in the humanities. Um, I will say um, I had expected that the scores of faculty who had signed an open letter in support of due process around the case of an anthropologist um, who was uh, being adjudicated over the last couple of years and who, um, whose, whose letter was greeted by students with a, um, a, di a cultural dynamic worthy of the cultural revolution, right? Uh, um, uh, apology, everything but dunce caps, apology statements, you know, faces whitened, people wore whiter foundation to make their, um, to make their statements and wore black to make their statements so that they were um, legible to the students as recognizing the profound harm of this letter. All these were humanists, most of them were humanists, and I thought they would all sign. None of them signed. None of them signed up with us, um, uh, saying that they had been so profoundly burned um, that they uh, that they weren't that they weren't going to join a solidarity again. Um, so I think we have work to do uh, in the humanities. Um, I think we we are probably. Uh, we skew male more than the campus as a whole, and um, uh, and definitely um, uh, towards uh, towards late career for sure. Got it. I want us to transition in a moment to audience Q and A. I see based on the last panel, it seems many of you have many questions you wish to ask. So we'll transition after I pose one question. Please take a moment to uh, ponder and 
consider any questions you may have for our panelists. I'm intrigued, Jane, by what you said earlier about how some people, when you, when you spoke to them, commented how you were so brave to do what you were doing. I, I find that most intriguing. I'm coming from the University of Missouri for my own doctoral program. There was a space there called Speaker's Circle, which is designated at more or less as the free speech space. Zone, right? The zone, zone exactly. And my initial thought was, well, I, and maybe I'm being too idealistic, but I thought the whole campus was meant to be a free speech zone, not just, and to be the place for open and robust dialogue. And granted, there are particular commercial reasons why they probably created such a space, but it just, get, it just sets for me the tone of what we are experiencing here and how it can be so brave for someone to even suggest that we have robust and open debate and inquiry for all. I would like for you to please describe for us, if you could, Jane, Flynn, any conversations you've had with fellow faculty, friends, family, others, and what is the wider buy-in for the type of work CAF is doing? What have been your experiences and conversations with folks and how they perceive what you're doing? Is it similar to people thinking you are so brave for what you're doing? Is it something else? Yeah, th this, is a, this is a great question. Um, and of course, we actually would like to survey the Harvard community to learn a little bit more about what people actually think. Because um, all of what we have are sort of just a few, I have a few anecdotes. I'll, I'll tell you just one anecdote. I was talking to one uh, woman on our faculty who's a very eminent scholar, um, and she was saying how supportive she was of what we were doing, how important she thought it was, and, 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 and was just 100% supportive. But, she, but the thing is, I'm hoping for a promotion, uh, and so I don't think I can join right now. Um, and it's like, you know, fine, people can make their own decisions. I don't, I don't put the hard sell on anyone or anything, but it's like that is, a, that is one kind of idea that like there are things, even if you're, this woman was a full tenured professor, in, you know, the top of her field, um, but there are still things they can take away from you, the they, whoever they are. Um, and so some people are, are worried about it. We've had people uh, say that they wouldn't join, and then once we added a bunch more members and we're actually kind of big, said actually I think I will join as a matter of, in, in the end, which is great, welcome. Um, so there is, there is fear. I've talked to, I remember once, one, one junior faculty member I was talking to, just I met her at a um, history department event actually, and I was saying, oh yeah, we're doing this thing, you'd be welcome to join, and there seemed to be a look of like momentary panic in her eyes, even just having the conversation. Um, and then so, you know, there is some anxiety about this, um, but we, I don't have a clear sense of what the campus as a whole has, has felt. The administration has been largely cautious but welcoming, warm at least. Um, I think that's a, a, a decision that was, they made about how to kind of receive us, which is great, and we're going to cooperate as much as we can with them. Um, but yeah, there's, there's certainly some, some fear and concern about you know, what having your name on our website, and we don't have anonymous members, so having your name on our website might mean. Yeah, I don't know how real any of that is, yeah, right? Like the, um, how consequential it is, although somebody, somebody who's tenured and hoping for a promotion is hoping to enter administration, and I think um, my, my read of the administrative conversations is that they would love to quietly co-opt this energy yeah. um, and uh, co-opt and, and channel into something that would be an acceptable product, um, perhaps uh, avoiding the lightning rod, terrifying phrases of free speech and civil discourse and um, flying under a sign like intellectual vitality, which maybe nobody has figured out um, should also be wrong. I, I too have had a lot of conversations that, um, that reduce to, I will really be wishing you well from the sidelines. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I think part of the culture of an institution like Harvard, and, and I, I wonder how this, is, uh, how this translates to MIT, we're very dispersed. Um, we're dispersed geographically. Uh, we're a kind of anti-solidarity campus, right? Department meetings don't do terribly meaningful work. Um, uh, faculty meetings are largely performative. Um, so the, um, you know, we're in Bob Putnam's bowling alone world as intellectuals in a much different way than University of Missouri, say, right? Like if you're the intellectuals in a college town, um, you, you might 
have more occasions to sort of hash stuff out in a zone that felt like a free speech zone. And yeah. I think there just aren't that many occasions yeah. of coming together on our campus. Um, and people are skeptical of it, right? Like there's a thing that I could join, that seems wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no faculty senate even at Harvard. Yeah. So, and the administration is very much does not want there to be a faculty senate at Harvard. Um, so even like, there's not even a single like, you know, even theoretically representative body in which the faculty could gather and discuss a discussion issue. Very good. Thank you both for your uh, comments so far. As we take questions from the audience, I invite you to consider as part of your answers how what you are doing with CAF benefits alumni and how alumni can be, of course, involved in this fight with, as well with faculty. I see a question way in the back there. Gentleman in the suit, please. So I, you know, I really believe in taking people at their word and, and trying to think of, so I believe she meant it. Um, and um, I, I think what she meant, and, and we would hear, we've heard similar de uh, depictions from students in, uh, there was a case in our School of Public Health where uh, students discovered eight years after the fact that some uh, faculty member had signed an anti-Obergefell brief. Um, and uh, gay and lesbian students felt, quote unquote, unsafe in their identity. So I think what she was describing was a position that she thought directly challenged her identity. And in addition to being taught that harm is everywhere, they are also taught that identity is everything. And you put those things together, and the chance for something to harm the core of your being um, uh, magnifies. Right, so that uh, somebody believing that uh, a fetus had rights that approached hers made her feel like uh, maybe unsafe and she didn't know what this person was gonna do to her. What if she lived in their state and they were gonna be a judge? I don't know, that's, that's how I would spin that out. Um, I think they have not had enough people telling them uh, what Flynn tells the toddlers, you're fine. You're, you're, you're fine. Um, and, I, and I have found, you know, thinking about like, what is, the, what is a successful pedagogy in this, um, uh, in this realm? The telling people, we're going to do a very hard thing. Oh, look at you doing that very hard thing. You are really strong. Um, that it, it, I don't, it works on my colleagues. Um, so I, you know, just, I'm just taking your question to the what is the potential remedy um, and uh, I think we are at a point where we must recognize the feeling. Um, I think there's just no way forward that doesn't say, that, no way forward that says we don't really feel that way. Um, uh, you know, but like uh, it's the improvisational yes and, yes you feel that way and look how strong you are, you're talking to me about this. No. Any comment there, Flynn? Yeah, I, I would just say I think, I think also, um, you know, the work we're doing with faculty and a lot of the alumni groups as well, it's very new. Um, and I think over time it gets easier because people are like, you're still here. You, you haven't been mm -hmm. defenestrated yet, you know, thrown out the window. Um, you somehow managed to survive. And, and I think people realize, oh, that's possible. Um, because I think, you know, part of, I mean, there, there are very good reasons for being alarmed about the state of academic freedom and intellectual life on our campuses. That's why we're here. But there's also ways to exaggerate it so that it, that it kind of creates this feedback where you think that the mob really is always lurking just around the corner with the pitchforks. Um, and that's only sometimes true. It sometimes is true, but it's not always true. Um, and also, like, hopefully there are some friends who will stand with you when, if and when the mob does come. And so that's what we're trying to do, be the, be the friends. I see that John Tomasi had a question, and then we'll turn it over to our Harvard student here in the front row. Go for it, John. Powerful. And the first, and the second point about them, as I understand, 
happening at Harvard, the first thing this group did, at least that I've heard publicly, was start was doing a poll. I received an email this summer asking us to call getting a poll going. I thought to myself again, they're they're leading as experts. They're leading like scholars. If you lead as advocates for open inquiry, you're implicitly saying their adversaries are going to fight this battle for it. And that is an act of bravery and courage to join that way. But the Harvard group is kind of doing it as an outside observer watching you guys in a way that's really interesting because what if instead of saying we're advocates first, we're saying we're experts mm -hmm. first? And we say to our colleagues, don't you want to learn more together about these things? And to Jane's point, the big point you made about this is a battle of ideas. It's not just activism on a campus mm -hmm. that change things. We need to have fundamental research responding to these ideas that words are actions. Mm -hmm. We need to have fundamental research. And that means not to be remaining siloed in our various campuses, those of us who work on these things, but networking um, as scholars, developing the arguments, the foundation arguments to change the way people see free speech. So I just think what the Harvard thing is fascinating, because it's Harvard, we're all watching. But more than that, because of the way you're doing it, we're all watching. Well, thank you. Thank you, and I will just say uh, one thing too. Um, we have created this as ex intentionally as a model that could be easily replicated elsewhere. Um, so the University of Toronto is launching very shortly with a council modeled on ours. Um, Columbia might be very close as well. Um, there, are, I've probably talked to rep representatives from 15 or 20 different universities who are interested, not all of them will go ahead, but interested in doing something. Um, and so we are actually hoping that in a year we'll have not like a national organization with chapters, but more a network of independent self-governing faculty groups who care about these things and can share best practices and the like. Um, so yeah, and, and the council was very deliberate, right? We want to be in the university, a, a, a kind of collection of scholars who are for the university, not against it, um, but for the university in its best form. I think your point about expertise is so important too, right? And and especially, you know, in the free speech landscape, something like AFA is a mutual defense organization. Oh, that already exists, right? The 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 advocate and defend. I think the you know we have we have data scientists. Let's survey. We have governance experts. Let's propose governance documents. We're all pedagogues. Let's think about what this means to our duty in the classroom. I think the um, aligning this work with the purpose of the university is absolutely, with, with the unique purpose of the university is absolutely crucial. Hi, uh, Caleb Kapocha, Harvard College student. Um, so I remember it's really interesting you mentioned that you no longer thought the faculty were the pillars of the organization and, and with the comment on the, the growth in student life, I'm guessing you're uh, referring to the, the new pillars and unfortunately is the large administrative state. Uh, and speaking of the administration, um, how, as faculty members, how open do you think the new uh, Harvard administration uh, under Claudia and Gay will be to free speech, civil discourse, uh, free inquiry? Well, um, we met with President Gay on Friday, um, the executive uh, committee of the council, um, and we had a probably 45 minute meeting. Um, she was very warm and welcoming. Um, she spent most of the time listening. Uh, she shared that, I don't, and this isn't betraying any confidence, uh, I don't think, she shared that she, sh she said that she shared some of our concerns um, and was not against the idea of working together. Um, so uh, there were not a lot of like firm commitments that came out of that meeting, um, but we are actively reaching out to the administration and hoping that we can, I mean, I think truthfully, it's likely that we are going to want to push a little harder to see change in certain ways than administrators are comfortable with, and that's probably all natural and to be expected. But um, we're hopeful for a warm working relationship. Um, we have our first kind of public event next week, a lecture with uh, one of our council co-presidents, Ned Hall, who's gonna give a lecture on the philosophy of, of campus free speech. It should be fantastic. It'll be live streamed if you're interested. Um, and um, you know, Dean Carana, the dean of the college, is gonna say a few words of introduction. And so any way we can, we wanna work together. Um, with the administration. What exactly that will mean long term, we just don't know. Um, and I suspect we will we'll kind of learn a little bit when we have sort of moments of controversy or flashpoints where we have to take a stand and the administration has to decide how to respond. Um, but that's still up in the air. Do we have any administrators in the audience? Um, I, you know, I, I think that... Um, yeah. I think that... Um, 
administrators in many large organizations, uh, corporations as well as universities, have as their highest goal to prevent reputational injury, as their highest goal. And yeah, I, but institutional too, right? It's, it's brand management. I think that as universities have corporatized over the last 50 years, that brand management has, has become a, a greater god among lesser gods. Um, so I guess the, the question for me is how could our administration, at which level could our administration best embrace uh, a, a non-antagonistic lesser god <laughs> as part of reputational success. Um, I don't think that's gonna come from the president's office. Um, very little comes from the president's office at an organization as large as Harvard. Um, can it build up through deans? Um, alumni can help here, right? Alumni saying, alumni writing the Harvard Magazine after it has an article about the, uh, the dawn of this council and saying, I have been waiting for this for years, instead of what an alumnus actually wrote and said, which is, I think this is a secret cover for something else. It's a Trojan horse. I don't know what's in the horse, but I'm sure I don't like it. Um, so um, I think the more pieces of our administration, including student life, that hear from alumni that they think this is a great development, that hear from students that in all the skills, like along with chair yoga, could you teach us to do this? That would be really exciting. Um, and from as many quarters as possible, I think a particular um, sort of flashpoint for administrations, including ours in this moment, is the need to think carefully about how the campus culture, of, how a campus culture of inclusion and a campus culture of expressive freedom can reinforce each other. Um, I think there is a, uh, a sort of reflexive um, uh, a feeling, it's, it's not a thought, it's a feeling, a reflexive feeling that uh, an academic freedom council and a set of DEI initiatives are orthogonal. Where can they be brought together? We all believe in an inclusive campus. We all believe that we grow from our differences, including ideological differences. I think administrators especially need us, need us to build a bridge so that they can see the path where they go out and talk to um, you know, the eight-figure donors, soon you're talking about real money, maybe the nine-figure donors, um, to, to say like, no, actually these things reinforce each other and here's how that happens at Harvard. So I think we can um, build, yeah. we can, it, in some ways if they co-opt us, that's success. That's right, and, and I will say too, I know for a fact that the Harvard administration hears frequently from donors, including from some of their biggest donors about these concerns. Um, Harvard, I, I imagine this is similar to MIT, Harvard uh, graduates, many of them, they graduate but they never actually leave. Like at least they leave their hearts in Harvard Yard. And so they pay attention to what, what is happening on campus. And so um, I know that they're regularly hearing this. And so I think the administration feels like they need to do something um, or, or respond in some way. And so they're feeling their way towards that. I, just to say one more thing, um, in addition to feeling like uh, it nourishes the emphasis of the brand on diversity and inclusion. I think um, uh, free expression dialogue across difference is a matter of workforce capacity and of national security. Uh, the Department of Defense recognizes this. They are investing heavily in civic education at K-12. Um, so I think if we can mobilize that messaging, right, like all of the alumni who are the powerful employers who re recruit on campus want, I, not that I believe that education is workforce capacitation, right. but this is, a, this, is a, this is a hobby horse we can ride, want workers who can mix it up because that's how you get ideas that are tested. Um, and, and, you know, I think all of us believe in our constitutional republic, and if we want to keep it, we need these, these dialogic skills. Um, so, so giving administrators the lines of why this is important, um, uh, why it is cosmically important, I think can help. A gentleman in the back. Yeah, hi. I'm uh, Mark Ramsayer. I'm a member of this uh, council. Hey. For, uh, one of our original members, for, a founding yeah, member. I signed up when it was not right. <laughs> <laughs> Happening in 
Well, but even I'll say even even Mark, I don't know that we disagree as much as you as as we might say. I I think there are not even disagreements, but just differences of tone. You know, so um, you know Steve Pinker is one of our co-presidents, and Steve is fiery, which is great because the fire fire is good for us. Others who are a little bit more like, come, let us reason together. I'm you the know. water element. There you go, <laughs> and that's great. And so we have those things. I I do think that we 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 fully created this group with the expectation that we would need to push and sometimes push hard. Um, and some of the impetus were some really egregious violations uh, of, of, of academic freedom and just um, uh, that had to do with particular faculty members. I think that what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how do we push back at the right moment um, and how do we push back in a way that's most effective, that's most likely to succeed. Um, I think we have this sense that at Harvard and I think a lot of other institutions, um, bomb throwers and provocateurs you need occasional, some of those mixed in, but those don't have great success long term because they're easy to marginalize. Uh, we intend, we, our hope is that we, we are very hard to ignore um, because we show ourselves to be not only like, you know, good faith partners, um, but people who are deeply committed to the mission of the university and intend, intend to be here and call the university to account when necessary. Um, but we're, we love having you, Mark, and, uh, see, and we, need, we need also need Mark around every once in a while to remember that like slow and cautious is not always the best way to go. Um, Great plant there for the audience. There you go. <laughs> Gentleman in the corner here. Yes. Yeah. Me? Yeah, okay. sorry. Well, I'm, I'm Charlie Lax. I'm a graduate, 82 graduate of the other university across the river, and I'm really aghast and appalled at what I'm hearing going on at Harvard. I joined this group because my good friend Bill Fresen uh, and I share the same uh, opinion of what was going on at MIT. And I'm just reminded of when I went to school at, uh, at BU of Howard Zinn and Murray Levin and how hard they fought for their rights to speak with my good friend, John Silver, I'm on the board over there, and, uh, and what they ended up doing. And I think you guys need some guts and you need some balls to get things going in the right direction at Harvard and I see it already starting to happen at MIT uh, because you know you just can't sit on your butt and wait for things to happen. Well, we're not. Um, so uh, <laughs> I hope so. I, I will say just maybe very briefly, um, there are three kinds of work we see ourselves doing. Um, one is um, providing aid and comfort and solidarity with faculty members and other members of the Harvard community who find themselves canceled or attacked because of speech. We've already had probably a half a dozen instances where faculty members have come to us concerned and we've been able to help them in various ways. Um, some, of, some of those will eventually be public, but it just depends on the individual faculty member. Um, the second kind of thing we're doing is, is more positive programming, public events, coursework and stuff to try to help shift the campus culture towards one that embraces free expression uh, in a way that it doesn't always now. And the third is like actual advocacy on policy issues. Um, and that we're still sort of for formulating how we do that. We are hoping to introduce a statement on academic freedom to the whole university. Uh, we have a draft, which we're actually talking with our members about today. Uh, we are taking a hard look at how diversity statements are used for hiring and appointments at Harvard. Um, and, and that's probably more like a, not a next few months sort of um, policy issue, but something we're looking at hard and, and hopefully to, to bring in, in the near future. So we're trying to do all these things together um, and, you know, but I will say we're just one group and we're grateful for the alumni as well and hopefully that they can, they can help us uh, as we go. Um, yes, Wayne. So uh, from an MIT perspective, we love what you're doing and we're very jealous of it. You know, uh, what I'm wondering is if there's some advice you can give our, your counterparts at MIT to do something like what you're doing because what's happened at MIT is that the statement on freedom of expression came from a group that was chartered by the administration. It was not a ground bottoms up group. Now, because it happened right in the aftermath of Dorian Abbott, they let a heterodox group of people on, on that group and they came up with a great statement. Mm -hmm. But then they all went back to the labs and the classrooms and nothing's happened since. You know, there's not a continuing faculty organized group that is, that is independent of the administration. What can they do? What should they do? Well, I would think the faculty, the faculty who wrote the statement might have interest in continuing the work under their own aegis. You know, they tell two friends, what's the old, land, the old shampoo commercial? I told two friends and she told two friends and so on and so on. Um, 
uh, you know, I think a, a heterodox group is the best kind of group to organize such a thing, and um, uh, it should be easier without administrative aegis, right? Having having done it with administrative aegis, so I, you know, uh, could you do? faculty organized discussion groups around the statement, around what it would mean to activate the statement in the classroom, um, what they hate about the statement, hear from people about how the statement makes them scared. And um, uh, I, you know, I would, I guess I'm, bottom line for me would be I would use the statement for the next kind of organizing, right? I, I'm envious of the statement, um, but no set of principles by itself um, can, can sort of self-operationalize. Yeah, and just only thing to add is like all, all you need to do to start a council is just have a handful of faculty members who want to start a council. Um, we, we literally just named ourselves that, and it yeah. make, it's 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 much it's much more like august sounding than the reality in some ways. Um, it sounds like we're like an official like uh, you know faculty governance governance group or something. We're just a group of faculty who like we have like a WordPress web page, you know, and it's like it, it's fine. <laughs> um, so if you have a group of faculty that are interested in doing that, I'm happy to talk. Um, I've already talked to several MIT faculty over the last six months, um, but yeah, I think if they just wanted to get together and decide what needs doing at MIT, I mean, we are we are not trying to take on every international kind of controversy. We think Harvard has plenty uh, of issues to deal with, and we're gonna, that's our mandate. And so we we would love to see an MIT group that's going to tackle <laughs> MIT issues, and a you know BU group that's going to tackle BU issues, and on and on. I'm gonna exercise moderator prerogative and pose the last question to wrap up a great discussion right now. Um, so what do you hope will come of CAF's efforts on, at Harvard? What is the end game, the end goal that you feel will allow you to say at the end of all this, mission accomplished? Well, you made me think of George W. Bush on the aircraft carrier when you said mission accomplished. So, um, I, yeah, I, I don't want to declare victory too soon because we've got a long way to go. Um, I would love, I would love it if um, students and faculty members, when they talk to their friends and colleagues, weren't afraid um, and could say what they thought and could be wrong sometimes and could learn. Um, and I would love it if there were there was an institutional kind of um, reflex. That one, when there was some some campus speech controversy, that everyone at the university, the administration, the faculty, and, and the, even the students would kind of respond by saying, "Yes, but this is the kind of community where we are. We allow for this sort of speech, and you're welcome to criti uh, respond with, with with reasoned critique, um, but we don't try to destroy people or their livelihoods. That's not what we do. Um, so if we can cultivate that instinct, and if we can like eliminate fear, I would think that would be an amazing accomplishment." Yeah, I would, you know, um, I don't think there is a destination, right? This is work that's never finished. Um, the, the whole history of uh, pre-First Amendment and, and First Amendment uh, life in the United States shows that it's, um, it's, it's achieved through contest and it, it needs continual guarding. I would love in some future version of a conversation with a student about a demonstration and a counter demonstration to have the students say, and I saw that there was a counter demonstration and I was so excited because I never get to talk to anybody who disagrees with me on this issue. Um, like that's the reflex yeah. that I want to yeah. cultivate. A tall order indeed, but one which we are all rising to fulfill. Thank you, Dr. Craddy, Dr. Kerensky, for your thoughts today. Thank you all for your questions. Let's give our panelists another round. Thank you.